Good morning, baseball fans, and welcome back to Dan's Vintage Baseball PC. Do not be fooled by the fancy name. It's just me and some friends talking about baseball cards. And today, uh, we're going to be talking about the baseball cards and the life and the career of one Monty Irvin. Uh, if you notice a bit of a theme this month, uh, you'll know that February is Black History Month. Last week, we uh, profiled... Uh, Campanella, Roy Campanella with our friend Stacy, who had that massive collection. This week it's um, Wade with the Monty Irvin collection. And next week I'm going to do a um, solo show uh, with my Sam Jethro PC. So um, nice little celebration of Black History Month. Three pioneers in the game, uh, three incredible individuals, and three African Americans. So that's um, a nice little theme we got going. So anyway, today's uh, show is about um, the great Monty Irvin, who was born in New Jersey in uh, 1919, and uh, he attended uh, Orange High School. Uh, Orange, New Jersey is, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes west of New York, 20 miles west of New York. Uh, he excelled at all sports, including football. Um, he got a football scholarship to the historically black college of Lincoln university and played there for a while. Um, but loved baseball and signed with the Negro leagues in, um, when he was 19 years old, 1938. And, um, Monty Irvin was one of the best players in Negro league baseball history. As you can see, there's a lot of black ink in his stats, which are uh, a work in progress, compilation of his stats. Uh, you see three batting titles, et cetera. Um, he ultimately enlisted in the war uh, and he was a United States um, war hero, uh, actually appeared at the Battle of the Bulge, uh, as did Warren Spahn. But uh, interestingly enough, I don't know if the two of them ever compared notes on that, but uh, so Monty Irvin comes back, a war hero, one of the best players in Negro League history, and ultimately um, he's playing for the Newark, Newark Eagles for multiple years and um, doesn't sign right away to the, to the um, Major League Baseball because the owner of the Newark Eagles uh, wanted compensation for Monty Irvin. Um, and ultimately they did uh, work out a deal, and he signed with the Giants in 1948. Uh, Eight. He played 1949 um, in the minor leagues, uh, and I put his his minor league stats up because they're crazy. Uh, his first year in the minor leagues for the Giants, he batted 373, uh, came up to the Giants for a little bit, went back to the minor leagues in 1950, where he batted 510. <laughs> so they called him up, uh, and he was up for good. The problem for Monty is that at that point he was 30 some odd years old. Uh, and I guess his prime was pretty much behind him at that point. Um, so he ended up um, only having a short major league career, but a glorious one. Uh, in 1951, uh, in large part because of Monty Irvin, the Giants made an incredible comeback and came uh, and, and beat the Dodgers in the playoff and went to the World Series. Uh, they went to the World Series in 1954 and won, so Monty Irvin got a ring. Um, and then as a 37-year-old, uh, he played one short season in, with the Chicago Cubs um, and uh, and then retired. And he had a great post-retirement career. Uh, he went on to uh, become – he worked for Major League Baseball for many years. He worked as a scout for many years. And fortunately, in 1973, uh, he was inducted into the Hall of Fame for um, with the Veterans Committee, who recognized not only his contributions to Major League Baseball, but to Negro League Baseball, and ultimately Monty Irvin um, was uh, enshrined. Uh, he lived a very long life. Um, he only died in 19, uh, I'm sorry, in 2016 at the age of 96. Uh, when he passed away, his number was on the uh, sleeves of the San Francisco Giants, who had retired his number several years earlier. So that's Monty Irvin. We'll get into a little more of it. Um, but uh, for now, I want to bring in our super collector friend Wade, how are you this morning, my friend? Good. How about yourself? Good. And uh, I know you're coming in to us from the west coast of the United mm -hmm. States, so bright and early. It's uh, rather early in the morning out there, yeah. so I appreciate the early rising. 
um, to of come course. on the show. So I ask all the guests, um, you know, what's your background in collecting? Uh, what's your background in, you know, sports in general? And also, um, why Monty Irvin? <clears throat> okay. Well, um, I got started collecting when I was younger, obviously, like most people's stories start out when they're a young kid, probably like five, seven years old. My mom would take me to Target and I'd buy some packs there. Um, but then uh, my uncle would come to my brother's baseball games when we, he was a little bit older than me and I wasn't playing yet. And he would hand me like junk wax packs and stuff like that. So I have a lot of like 90s leaf and a lot of 90s clear. I still have like my old binder of that kind of type of stuff. Um, but he actually gave me some like 58 tops, which were probably my first vintage oh, cards. Nice. Um, I think I still have like a really beat up Frank Zupo and like a really beat up Whitey Herzog. So um, that's how I got started, I guess, in my vintage journey. But I took a break for a long while. Um, you know, when you get into high school and your your life focuses shift mm -hmm. into girls and sports and things like that. Um, so then I started getting interested again, probably right after college, but, you know, looking for work and things like that took a, took its time and I was traveling for work quite a bit. Um, and then just a few summers ago, I was in the card shop and I looked and I saw like a rookie Randy Johnson, the Fleer one. Um, and then I was like, huh, I don't have that in my collection. I never thought to like try and get one of those when I was younger. So I bought it and I probably overpaid for it because I was in like an antiques store. And so I just started there and just dove head in on buying things that I only dreamed of getting when I was a kid. Uh, Cause you know, now I have a job, I have those funds to do that. Um, yes. It's, it's a common journey. Yeah. I, I mine is similar. Of course, mine is older. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the sort of I, I, I admire the people who have been in the hobby all along mm -hmm. because the dedication. Because when I was in college, I was a big baseball fan. In fact, I played baseball in college. Yeah. Um, but uh, I didn't collect cards. But when I came home after school. I was like, you know, back home with my parents' house. I was like, oh, yeah, these cards. And then I started getting into it. And that was like the late 80s. So it was like, you know, the real sort of like the, the hobby took off at that yeah. point. So I was in the hobby then for like several years. And then I got married and then I had kids. And then I have sons and my sons collected baseball cards. And suddenly I'm into it again. And then yeah. there was a um, really tragic event was the uh, Hurricane Sandy which was the super storm that hit in the fall of 2012. And um, my collection was housed at my parents' house and my parents lived on the water uh, and they got flooded. And so I lost about, I don't know, at least a third of my collection to wow. Hurricane Sandy damage. Um, but that sort of spurred me on. I took a lot of it back here into Manhattan, put it in storage, went through it, figured it out. And that's when I started up again. Um, and I haven't stopped. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there we go. Um, so this is a baseball card channel. So let's look at some baseball cards. We start off with my selection of Monty Irvin, which is modest, but um, pretty good cards here. We have the 52 tops that I, um, that I showed a few weeks ago. We have the 52 Bowman, which I love. This is a card that I um, purchased raw and um, sent into SGC. When they were grading tough, and they gave it a five, I think if they graded it now, they'd probably go six, six and a half. Um, and then we have the uh, 52, uh, I'm sorry, 53 Bowman Color. Mine's a five. We'll see a nicer one in a little bit. Uh, and then the Dan D, which I'll show in a second. And then the kind of the sad one, which is the 56 tops. Uh, a card, which, by the way, I probably should send in to grade because it's super sharp. <laughs> Uh, nice. it looks but the dandy, similar. yeah, it, it's it's nice. And then the dandy is um is I guess this sort of oddballish card that I have, um, mm. a uh, 1954. I thought it was 53. It's 54 set that came in potato chip bags. 
So condition is always an issue because you get little smudges of potato chip grease. Um, this one is pretty nice. Um, I was looking at it before we went on air. There's actually kind of a bit of chipping on the bottom, and it's a, mm -hmm. kind of worse in the back. So it's got a three, um, but it's a beautiful um, Monty Irvin pose. It's a picture we'll see again um, in other cards. In fact, I think it's the same picture. Yeah, it's the same picture as the as the 52. Yeah, that and the Stallmeyer use the same image, and I love Stallmeyer, yep. Too. So uh, let's get on to your collection. And you sent me the money shot and then the food shot. I love this photo on the right. I'm thinking this dude looks stacked. I mean, he's got these broad shoulders and you could just see that he's like this muscular guy. And oh, there yeah, he is we'll filling up yeah. what looks like a breakfast from what I can tell. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, toast. <laughs> some some decadent, delicious, sweet breakfast, it looks like, after he signs yeah. his contract for a 1954 season. Is that what the, the is that what the sort of storyline of that yeah. photo is? Yeah. The caption <laughs> on the back is Yeah. Um I don't want to read it verbatim because it might take a little bit, but yeah. Uh Monty Irvin, New York Giant outfielder, smiles broadly as he enjoys a chicken dinner, actually. So touched oh, with dinner. Okay. And then uh January 26th, after signing his 1954 contract with the National League Club, Irvin, who will be 33 years old on the 25th of next month, signed for an estimated $25,000. Wow. Yeah. Good so, for him. That, yeah, was a good bit of money back then. I, I think I looked it up at one point. It was like, that's a quarter of a million dollars, which isn't huge money nowadays for a contract, but I imagine back then it was, it was pretty good. So um, I'm looking at the uh, at the money shot on the left, and a lot of that stuff we're going to see in coming slides. Mm -hmm. But I think there's one in there that we don't have, and it's him sliding into home plate. Yeah, so I definitely I definitely want to talk about that one later. Yeah, let's but let's start with that one. Okay, go ahead. So that's right here. It's a uh, him stealing home in the 1951 World Series. Okay, and so that's Yogi Berra, a, and it's that yeah, that's Yogi Berra, and it's auto nice. down here. Um, yeah, actually, I got this. Um, it was actually quite big when I purchased it. It was a lot bigger. It's not a Type One photo or anything like that. So, don't worry. Right. I, I I trimmed it down to fit in the holder and just fit better in my collection because it was just, I think like sixteen by twenty or something like that. It was a full poster. Right. Um, but yeah, it's just uh, but the auto, the auto is yeah. fine. Mm -hmm. it's um, a great looking so auto. there's some stuff. Let's start with uh, cards. Here we go. So the 51 tops game card to the left, um, mm -hmm. which uh, I, I think I've confessed in prior episodes, I'm not a terribly big fan of that set, but I think that's his rookie, right? Yeah, if you consider things like that, rookie cards, some people don't. But, um, you know, he has the 51 Bowman that I right. consider more of, more of a rookie. But, you know, as one of Topps' first releases, yeah, that would be considered, I guess, as Topps' rookie. Yeah. And then you got um, two copies of the 52 Topps. Yeah. Can you tell me which one is Redback and which one is uh, Blackback? I'm feeling like Blackback is the one that's right next to the 51. Yeah, got it. Just a little duller got... in color. Yeah, exactly. And Good then you got um, yeah. the 53 tops mm -hmm. with uh, Monty Irvin on a farm. <laughs> I've had that Is card that any number of times. I've had Is it that... probably three times. And recently, I subbed what I thought was going to get a high grade, and SGC gave it like a four. So I it's moved tough. that one. I, I, the problem with that card is the bottom left, the black um, bordering mm -hmm. there. It's always chipped. And I, like I said, I thought I found one that where the chipping was little enough that they were going to give it like a five or a six and it ended up getting a four. So yeah. someday I'll own a high grade copy of that. Um, yeah. And then we got the 54 mm -hmm. tops. Um, and then, of course, the 55 
you know, four point five. Yeah. Um, have, I don't have the so 56, here's the, the but say that again. I, I don't have the fifty six. Um, yeah, the fifty six. It's kind of I don't know. It's a gorgeous it's card. Kind of sad, in a way, because it is That's, a great card. He's making like a yeah. running catch there. You know, it's a nice portrait. Uh, it's a classic fifty six card, and the problem, of course, is that he's on the Chicago Cubs. Which yeah, nothing against that's... the Cubs, but Monty Irvin is a giant for life. So um, exactly, it's kind of you know. And the other sad thing about it is the way that they kind of treated him in the end. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, yeah. this was a guy who was a World Series star. Came was like third in MVP voting one year, helped them win two World Series, and then he got off to a slow start in 1955, and they sent him to the minor leagues. Yeah, uh, he spent more time in '55 in the minor leagues than he did in the major leagues, which yeah. is kind of sad. And that's how he got picked up by the Cubs because he got drafted out of yeah. what, the Rule Five or whatever yeah. it was back then. And then the Cubs put him out in the outfield, but um, he got injured, and then he had a back problem. He retired after the '56 season, but he was also 37 years old at that point. Yeah. Um, so here we go. We got the '51. The rookie card is on the left. The 52, mm -hmm. Bowman in the middle, and then, of course, that absolute stunner on the right. Um, not only, uh, you know, the grade is 7.5, which is really high end for the mm -hmm. 53 Bowman, but also this this photograph is kind of amazing. Um, yeah, it's, it's just stunning. It's the, the, you know, the smile, the look. He's got the mm -hmm. bat, and then behind him, you can see the um, it's polo grounds that green. Um, you can see it off to the sort of right above his hand there, mm -hmm. uh, and then you know the lighting from the polo grounds over his right shoulder. So just a gorgeous fifty-three moment. And I know you know having collected a lot of these, um, including a lot of slabs, that it's tough to get seven point five. How'd you get this one? Um, you know, I was just browsing. I hadn't picked this one up yet, so this wasn't an upgrade. It was my first uh, 53 Bowman of him. So I was just looking and just saw some high grade pop up, and I just kept tracking it and tracking it until until it was right at the t in the, the auction on eBay and threw in a last minute snipe and walked away with it at a price I was very very happy with. You know, um, nice. It's it's modern, so he's not a super a lot of his stuff isn't super high end um, in terms of pricing, um, but I couldn't. To finish his Giants run in my collection, I just saw this card and I was like, I knew I had to have it. And it's a, uh, it is a stunner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I so guess. here's a couple of a uh, couple of oddballs. The one on the left is, of course, the double play. Is that what it's called? No. Double header. Double header, right? I only have one of these um, mm -hmm. cards, but you know, there's a whole backstory behind them. Yeah, because there's a different player on the back. Yep. Who's the other player on this one? The other player on this one is Kiermer. First Kiermeyer. Sorry. Okay. And uh, and we'll get to that photo that's used yeah. for that. Art in a bit. But this one is uh, this one's unperforated, which oh, is oh, one, oh. one of the reasons I got it. And usually, okay. there's like the perforation for the folding, right? Like you can fold them and stand them up, and there's that story, or I guess it's it's truth. You can um, set them up in a circle, and it creates like a yeah. all the images in the background kind of connect and makes like a stadium. So yeah. But this one is unperforated, which is one of the reasons I got it in the three. Um, the centering is good, but having it unperforated doesn't like distract from the image, which is um, part of my collection. That we'll get to in a second. And then there's, uh, of course, the Starcal decals, yeah. um, this... which is tough. That's a tough one. I know yeah, we talked about this. The Willie Mays, the, there's a, the type two of this is this shot of Mer Irvin and then with Willie Mays on the other side, the dual player one. And that is something I 
really been looking to grab at some point. I have uh, seen a few pop up on eBay. I've chatted with somebody about making an offer on it, and then it was gone in like five minutes of being posted because it was a really <laughs> good price. And well, one of these days I'll get one. But there, yeah, it's, it's um super cool. It, it reminds me that um, another contribution of Monty Irvin when he came into the major leagues was that um, DeRocher asked him to become sort of a mentor for Willie Mays um, in 51 because Willie Mays was like a 20 year old rookie and yeah. you know was from the south and was suddenly living in New York City. So mm -hmm. Monty Irvin, who was from the New York metropolitan area, was extremely helpful to Willie Mays. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Willie acknowledged that over the years. And I yeah, think I that's mean, part of the reason why Monty Irvin is so beloved in Giants lore is because, you know, he sort of shepherded in the franchise's greatest player. Um, yeah, they were good but friends. But it's funny because, oh, yeah, till, till the they end. They were good friends throughout um, their life, and they yeah. ended up, also owning like a liquor store together and there's a classic image of them handing crates down uh, one to another uh loading uh -huh. up their liquor store and i mean they just had a fantastic relationship he became like a father figure to him in new york and, and Mays gives him all the credit of you know knowing how to talk to him knowing how to treat him and you know showing him the ropes of new york and um up until the end when monty Irvin passed away Mays. I don't think he attended his funeral because he was so, you know, distraught over it. He sent a letter to be read at the funeral that basically says he wasn't ready to say goodbye to his friends. So yeah. they were just really, really close throughout their lives. And he, um, he said at one point um, that, yes, he mentored Willie for a few years, but after a while, Willie was showing him the ropes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Willie kind of, um, you know, got his act together and was doing pretty well there, obviously. Mm -hmm. So I see what you did here. You took uh, the double header, the 55 tops, and a beautiful type one photo um, of that same follow through, uh, which is used in each circumstance. Yeah. Now, the set, the type one, you know, let me let me get uh, closer up on that. Uh, PSA uh, mm -hmm. slabbed. Yep. Tell us about this one. So this is the action shot, obviously, from the 55 tops. Um, yep. I grabbed this off Golden. It was around that time that they were taking a long time to send things out, but yep. uh, they got it to me. And, you know, I had, I was just browsing around. Our friend, good friend Lucas, actually showed it to me. And that was the same auction that he got his Red Heart. Uh, show next and it was uh um just something i saw and i was like kind of threw in like one bit at the very end i didn't think it would hold but i was super lucky that it did and yeah. uh i love i have a one of william mays and don newcomb from the same photographer it's a uh, william jacob ellis and i just think uh, you know it's a, it's a very odd angle almost you never yeah. see this type of photography um it's always almost looks like ground. he's on top he's like on top of the dugout yeah because so i think um or... monty is in front of the dugout yeah you can see the stairs there yeah so um, I mean, is that very odd is Go it polo grounds yeah it is polo grounds you can see very deep into the outfield oh yep 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 there it is nice so yeah i don't have a lot of polo ground imagery in my collection but i mean it's such a beautiful ballpark that i I need to add some more. Um, but yeah, being able to, you know, showcase this photo alongside a card is it's it's pretty fun. And it and, and it's funny because the um the double header card they complete they you know completely invented an entire background behind it. Yeah, I mean it's kind of an odd <laughs> perspective. It's just the shift <laughs> a downward view to uh right in front of you. Uh, yeah, a horizontal view, but it's very cool. And it's a beautiful card, here. both of them, the colors. Okay, so you sent me these photos, and the one on the left, I 
said, oh, that's the shot from his 51 Bowman. Um, but you've told me, no, it's not. Yeah, so while I believe both were taken at spring training at this ballpark, um, Florida, uh-huh. I think the one, and I'm pretty sure one of the Burke Ross Monty Irvins, and I can't remember which year he's in. But he's in fifty. He's not shot. in fifty one. He's he's in fifty two. Okay, but I'm pretty sure yeah, he's not the in the fifty one sh- set. Yes, it's the same shot as that Burke Ross, but you can okay Burke Ross is zoomed back, and you can see his whole body is kind of twisted. His legs a little bit. His back leg is out wider. Um, but this is a I think it's a type two photo because I looked up the the stamping on the back and it it's from the nineteen sixties. Um, okay. But it's a super clear shot um, off the rake, original negative. And I just love the contrast of, you know, the black outline of his uniform and the pinstriping against that, like, very bright uh, Florida sky. The, uh, let me just go back to, there's the 51 on the left. But, yeah, you're right. It, it is a different shot. But, you know, it's the same kind of follow through. Mm-hmm. Um, now, the picture on the right. What's the story behind the picture on the right? The picture on the right, I believe, is a snapshot. I picked it up. Um, it's a little bit bigger than a than a normal snapshot would be, but um, a snapshot being a fan photo um, or family member taking a quick photo with like a consumer brand camera. Um, uh-huh. But it's a little blurry. But I just love that it it's a, like a nice close up shot. Um, you have a date on it a year on it i don't have a date on it and i can't tell the background of the park it's five by yeah, seven it's also... i think it might be polo grounds it looks like a home jersey for the new york giants yeah i'm not sure there's a players in the background but i can't really tell oh you're right and i am ashamed because i love digging into background the background of cards and stuff like that. So uh, that's a number six on the Giants. If you have a uh, off the top of your head, can think of who that would be. Uh, not off the top of my head. I'd have to check, but I'll check it afterwards and maybe yeah, uh, me too. send a little, <laughs> a little note yep. uh, in the description of the video. And uh, so I think this is the last, yeah, this is our last uh, slide here. So, Two very, very important photos. One is, of course, on the left, and we talked a little bit about Willie, um, mm-hmm. but there they are together. Um, yeah. This looks like pregame batting practice. Uh, hard yeah, to say so... what park it's at, but does it say? Uh, it doesn't say, but again, that looks like the home uniform. Um, right. And that is actually from 1951. You can tell by the, the sleeve on there. Or the patch uh-huh. on their sleeve is that 75th National League anniversary patch. So that of course right. would be from, you know, Mazes rookie year. Um, so pretty cool image. Uh, it's a contact sheet proof, which would mean they used the original negative and put it directly on that photo paper sheet. And there's right. n- no loss of clarity. It's about five by seven. Yeah, where'd you get that? Um, I actually picked that up, rescheduled our talk, and I got it probably just last weekend. So I was a little worried because that same dealer <laughs> that we both bought photos from yes. uh, was uh, taking their time sending things, but you know it ended up coming, and I, I couldn't be more thrilled with owning something like that. There's no photographer information on the back, but... Um, it's one of really? the clearest images I have in my collection. Cause I, um, the two photos that I bought from the same, um, dealer, both have stamps from the original photographer on the back. So they're type ones. Is that Barney um, Stein? Yeah, I believe so. Um, yeah. they're two Dodger, uh, I'm sorry, the spawn in a, a Boston uniform. And, um, there's a 55 world series with furlough and barrer. Bauer, um, mm-hmm. which is, they're two amazing shots. I'll show them when I get them. I just actually just got tracking 
tracking numbers today. So they should wow. be coming in soon. So the picture on the right um, is Monty Irvin playing left field mm -hmm. uh, in the Polar Grounds, I believe. Actually, and making a. Uh, this is Yankee Stadium. Again? Oh, this Yankee, is Yankee Stadium. Stadium. Yeah. Oh, okay. So. Um, this is so, game one again of the 51 World Series, and right. um, this is a game that Mays had or Irvin just had a fantastic, a fantastic game. Um, right. He robbed this home run in the eighth inning. Um, who uh, who hit it? Do you know? Uh, Hank Bauer. Oh, okay. So speaking of Hank Bauer, yeah, speaking <laughs> of, um, but in the first inning, he actually. And this, this is what he did in the first inning. He stole home on Yogi Berra. Right. Uh, Allie Reynolds was the pitcher, and he had taken, you know, quite a bit of time getting to home plate uh, with only a runner on third. Um, so Irvin went to DeRocher, who actually coached third base then. And he said, mm -hmm. you know, he's taking his time. Like, I can make it. And DeRocher gave him the green light to steal home. And then when he got called safe, uh, Yogi said, no, no. And Irvin was, yes, yes, Yogi. Um, Yogi, <laughs> yeah. ended up asking well, him, the... uh, Yogi ended up asking him how he knew. And Irvin told him he'll see it in the Daily Mail and the Daily Mirror tomorrow. And that's the photo then. Yeah. Right? Yep. That's Because uh... Yogi... Uh... It's also famous for disputing whether Jackie Robinson was safe at home, yeah, stealing so I mean, home in game one of the 1955 World Series. So Monty yeah, Irvin got there first. It's funny how those things work because, you know, I mean, <laughs> Jackie was the first first black ball player, as we all know, um, across the color barrier. And then, you know, before it was going to be Monty Irvin, it was years before that all the Negro League uh, executives got together and said, you know, if there's a player we want to break the barrier, it should be Monty Irvin. Because at the time, he was he was the best player in the Negro Leagues. He right. was charismatic. He could play. He could. He was a great guy. He was tough. Um, it was just a shame that he lost his prime years to World War II, and he, it took him a long time to get back into the swing of things when he got back. And that's actually one of the reasons that he didn't want to sign too, that he didn't feel like he was up to speed on his baseball. Right, he was he didn't get to play like a lot of guys did in World War Two. Yeah, yeah. He um, he was in Europe, uh, in in mm -hmm. fighting in Europe. Um, and like I said in the intro, he's he's actually was at the Battle of the Bulge, which is a particularly brutal mm -hmm. um, series of battles on the Belgian um, German Belgian border, and. Um, I know Warren Spahn actually got a Purple Heart from Battle of the Bulge. So a lot of these guys, as you know, played baseball for the war uh, a lot of times in the U.S. Uh, but, yeah, Monty was one of those guys that went out and, um, you know, actually fought in, yeah. in battle. Um, one of the other things about Monty Irvin is um, he's the first, he's part of, the first all African American outfield um, with Willie Mays and Hank Thompson. Um, so the three of them uh, were pioneers in that respect. And yeah. he also um, was, I guess, he's the first African American of some other thing having to do with the World Series. And I can't remember what it was. Um, but he also yeah. was, in some ways, uh, held back by the fact that the Newark Eagles were owned by a husband and wife who were um, not interested in just giving away their players to the, um, to the major mm -hmm. leagues. And Is that um, the Manleys? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And mm -hmm. um, they didn't, they wanted compensation, which yep. they should have gotten, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like, a, I mean, you, you don't just give away players, the players, you know, if they're playing for you, you you're entitled to some sort of compensation. So I think they ended up paying the Giants ended up paying the Newark Eagles like five grand or something um, mm -hmm. for the rights to sign Monty Irvin. And then yep. and then, like I said, they put him in the minor leagues and he started. He's and then the the after he played a little bit in the in 
49. They sent it back to the minor leagues in 1950, and he batted over 500. And I guess they were like, "Well, we got to call him up now." He's like, yeah. he's hitting you, 500. What are you doing? <laughs> Putting me up against these scrubs. He's going to bat in 510. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. Yeah, but like, I mean, yeah. What I Monty so, Irvin's. He's he's just a he's a class act of a guy. And what is he in three baseball Hall of Fames? He's in the National Hall of Fame, uh, the Mexican Hall of Fame, and I think he's also in the Puerto Rico Baseball Hall of Fame. Yes, that's right. He, um, I guess, he had some sort of dispute prior to the war. He had mm-hmm. some sort of dispute with the owners of the team, and he went down and played a season or a half a season in Mexico. Yeah, um, I mean, if you look at his stats, um, yeah, from playing in the Negro Leagues, and he wasn't. He had a new contract coming up, and he didn't have. You know, he didn't have to play for them, and he just ended up going down to the Mexican League, and he batted. I think like he missed like a third of a season, but yeah, became their MVP. so he's. I mean, the problem with a lot of these the the Negro League stats are that they're not obviously not complete, um, but mm-hmm. they've got him batting. I think it's three sixty seven in forty one, and then forty two he plays hardly plays at all. I think forty two is the year he went down. Um, to Mexico to play, and then 43, I think he enlisted, um, and then he missed the entire season of 44 and most of 45. So he pretty much missed three full years in his prime, in his mid-20s um, for the war, yeah. um, and then came back and played for Newark in 46 and 47 and 48. So it, it took them a while to get him um, into – the um, into the majors, but then when he did, he was he was ready to go. Mm-hmm. So that's uh, sure you got it. Yeah, go ahead. About sure. Monty Irvin being you know the guy he was, and you know he's a hero to a lot of people. But I think one of the most important people he was a hero to was actually Roberto Clemente. He was okay. Roberto's favorite player, and Roberto would you know come to the ballpark and watch him from right field. And he gives Monty Irvin credit for, you know, being um, the reason why he developed such a good arm that he would emulate uh, Monty Irvin's throwing style. And there is like a little bit of information on the internet and a lot of, I think, conjecture maybe that Irvin would come to the ballpark and, um, Clemente would be there and all these young kids would try and like do things for the players to get into the ballpark for free. And Irvin actually says that Roberto would he'd give Roberto his suit to carry in so that uh, Monty or yeah, Roberto could get into the stadium for free. And, you know, I think when you're a mentor to Willie Mays, a hero to Roberto Clemente, you know, you you have to be yep. a damn fine ball player. Like, yep. To inspire guys like that, and uh, you know the nice thing is he got into the Hall of Fame mm-hmm. pretty early on uh, in '73 mm-hmm. because uh, I guess it was '65 when Ted Williams was was um, inducted and he gave in his speech a admonition to the to the Hall of Fame like you better start getting the early players in here, um, yeah. and so it was only you know five or six years well like eight years later that he got that he got in um and of course uh monty Irvin was still uh, his face was still around because he was working for major league baseball for, for quite yeah, a number of he, years so he was actually uh the executive or who was the um oh what's the word i guess the head of the, the commissioner the um, commissioner was um i guess ford frick Hired Monty, and then Bowie Kuhn came in, and I'm not sure if Bowie Kuhn did anything. Oh, although actually, there's a Hank Aaron story yep. um, with Monty Irvin before we break. That Hank Aaron, uh, when he broke, when he tied Babe Ruth, it was in Cincinnati, and Bowie Kuhn was there. Uh, and then they went back to Atlanta when he he actually broke the record, uh, and. Bowie Kuhn didn't go to Atlanta. He sent Monty Irvin as his representative. Um, so Monty was, you know, was representing Major League Baseball on the night that um, Hank Aaron broke Babe Ruth's record. So yep. he's there again. Say, he's like, uh, yeah, <laughs> another historical moment for a 
for an African American player, and there's Monty Irvin showing, you know, the support. So mm-hmm. good for him. Um, Wade, I want to thank you for getting up super early and uh, West Coast time, and coming on and showing us your fabulous collection, and being able to talk about a very special uh, African American baseball player and pioneer on, uh, you know, right in the middle of Black History Month. So um, I think that's something that we can feel pretty good about. Uh, and, mm-hmm. you know, got to see my little bit of collection. So uh, that's, that's what great, we do here. Yeah. Uh, next me. week. Yeah. Next week I mentioned I'm going to do a solo show on my Sam Jethro PC. He's uh, over here somewhere. Uh, and then after that, I'm doing a few other shows that got lined up. Um, so I really appreciate you coming on my friend and, um, showing us your stuff and, uh, maybe we'll have you on again in the, in the future. Cause I know type ones are your thing and, uh, mm-hmm. I'd like to see more of them for different players. So, yeah. uh, viewers have a great Super Bowl weekend and we'll see you next Saturday. <laughs>